to people like Mr. Chuck Fonzo. Thank you, Brian, uh, very much indeed, and good evening to you all. Uh, you don't get crowds this big in Chicago or Paris. What a, uh, it's an, an incredibly uh, excuse me, uh, great to see so many people out. Uh, a really big draw for a, a good service. That's got a bit of a back ring to it. Is it better if I speak closer? Maybe. Okay, I'll try, I'll try speaking from there. Um, so, yes, this is our chosen subject, the McClintock uh, family. Um, it was while I was researching this that I realized, uh, or was reminded, that I'm, I'm actually a whole lot more Scottish than I think I am. Uh, I had a, one of my grandmothers was uh, from a Scottish family. Um, my wife, my wife uh, is of Scottish origin, the Craigie family. Uh, I was at school in Scotland from the age of 13 to 18. And uh, I know the name Turtle Bunbury isn't very Scottish. But uh, my real name, and don't tell anybody, is James Alexander Hugh McClintock Bunbury. Uh, so, there we go. Um, so what I'm going to endeavor to do in the space of uh, maybe, maybe 45 minutes or something, let's see what time we're starting. Something along those lines, let's give you a whirlwind tour of what um, the McClintock story. So, what we do is we begin at the beginning, um, uh, and we begin with a fish. Uh, I am not uh, saying that the McClintocks started uh, with a descendant from a fish, although that is uh, entirely possible, of course. The reason I, I have a fish here, and it is a, a trout, uh, is because the, uh, the McClintock name, originally, uh, apparently derives from Machgiola Fintock, uh, which would have meant uh, in the old days the gilly, oh sorry, the son of the gilly of Fintog. That's what they say, and as you, I'm sure, are all aware, a gilly is uh, somebody who looks after fishing primarily or possibly hunting. So the concept is that we descend from somebody who was a gilly. Um, then you try and work out who was Fintock, and in um, McClintock, traditionally, and there are some McClintocks amongst us here, traditionally it's said that he was St. Finian, uh, who came from Michel in County Carlo, which is where I'm from. I don't know what he, how he ended up in Scotland as such, but uh, recently I've been doing a little bit of uh, research on it, and I've got a new hot favourite for Findock, and that is St. Findock, who is a Scottish saint. And she was actually one of nine maidens, nine sisters, uh, who kind of invented being a nun, uh, that concept, uh, way back uh, before time began practically. Uh, they grew up near Dundee and uh, they, after the, the death of their father, they lived together in what basically sounds like a convent um, uh, and living a very austere life, eating nothing but barley and drinking water and working, toiling the land all day. Anyway, one of these girls uh, was called Fintock and there is a chapel dedicated to her on this rather beautiful island, Inishale Island, in Loch Awe, which is over on the west coast of Scotland in Argyllshire, as it is these days. Um, and so there's the chapel of Fintock is there, and in, in fact, there's still the remains of this chapel. And it transpires that the earliest record of McClintock's uh, owning any land or property is on the shores of Loch Awe. So I'm assuming that the original gilly was connected to this chapel, perhaps. Then, we, uh, the McClintock story, generally we think we're from Loch Lomond, which I've always known about ever since reading Tintin. If any of you know Tintin, it is Captain Haddock's favorite whiskey. Um, so I always love the idea that the McClintocks were from uh, Loch Lomond, and they are. Uh, there is definitely a pocket of McClintocks over on the west side of there, in a place called Luss. The lands of Luss um, is where they hail from. Um, just, I don't, I, it's probably quite hard for you guys at the back to see anything, let alone a map. But um, just to give you a rough idea, Loch Lomond is up here, and Loch Awe is up here. Um, and the, the, the girls living in the convent are, are over there. Um, so, where the people who lived in Loch, um, 
in Loch Lomond, the McClintocks from there were tenants of somebody called uh, the Duke of Lennox, or the Earl of Lennox, actually, rather, at the beginning. Um, and we have some Lennoxes here as well this evening, so I'm sure that is uh, relevant to them. Um, but in uh, the 13, 1368, the Clan Calhoun um, became the, the, the landlords of, um, of that area around Luss. Uh, and they were made, this is a statue of Robert the Bruce, and I love that you have Edward the Bruce in this county, uh, buried up at the Hill of Focher. Um, I know that there are spoil sport historians like me sometimes who come around and tell you that, that that's not really Edward the Bruce buried up there on the hill, but I've been there and I believe it is Edward the Bruce. It feels like it's Edward the Bruce. Um, anyway, it was his, uh, well, that's his brother Robert the Bruce, and it was his um, son David, uh, David Bruce, the king, King David Bruce, um, who basically put the clan Calhoun in charge of the lands of Luss, of which the McClintocks were kind of tenants at that point. Um, it just, because I want you to start thinking of Scotland and Ireland as being two countries that were really very interrelated at that time. Robert the Bruce was married to Elizabeth de Burgh, whose dad was the Red Earl of Ulster, the biggest land uh, owner in Ulster at that time. Uh, and so his son, King David, who was king of Scotland for 42 years, I think, was, um, you know, his mum was uh, the, the, the daughter of the Earl of Ulster. Okay. We move through. The first record of a McClintock is something in a Scottish book called the Book of the Dean of Lismore, not to be confused with the Book of Lismore, which is from County Waterford. This is a, a Scottish manuscript that was written in Gaelic um, in the early 16th century, and was written for the MacGregor family. And um, the MacGregors, uh, who ruled over uh, a large part of this district, and from whom Rob Roy MacGregor, he's probably the most famous member of the family, um, and in this uh, book, in the book of the Dean of Lismore, the first reference that I know of, anyway, to uh, McClintock is to a guy who uh, was uh, the clan bard, or a man of songs, uh, uh, who had written, uh, penned a poem of praise to Malcolm MacGregor, the fourth chief of the clan MacGregor, and that was written in about 1440. We fast forward to the arrival of James, well he had been James VI of Scotland, but uh, in 1603 he became James I of England, and hasn't he got a very fine hat? I have to say, I've always thought that was an excellent, excellent hat. Um, we, as I said, I don't know, where, and it's not strictly relevant, whether our McClintocks came from Loch Luss or Loch Orr or what, but, uh, and maybe someday there will be, for all of us, maybe someday there's some undreamt of way where we can actually find out where we really came from that none of us have yet considered, maybe through DNA or whatever. Um, but what I do know is that the McClintocks, um, well, apparently they first arrived in Ireland in 1597. I'm not sure about that. Like any family, when you start searching for family histories with some of these families, uh, it, can, it can be a very frustrating experience. McClintocks, if you search the annals, they come up as McClendock, McClendock, McClendick, 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 McClendick. We could be here all night, uh, all the different uh, con con connotations of it. But fundamentally, there were McClintocks who were loyal to the Calhoun family, uh, the Earls of Lennox, who were quite posh. And there were McClintocks who were loyal to the McGregor family, who had a reputation for being a little bit more rowdy. And two weeks before James became king of England, um, there was a great big battle. Um, this isn't the battle, but it might have looked something like this. Um, and it was fought at Glenfurren, near Loch Lomond. And it began when, well, two of the McGregors uh, were feeling hungry and they took one of the Calhoun's sheep and ate it. And then they were captured and brought before the Calhoun chieftain who had them executed, which is a bit extreme for sheep stealing, really. Um, and the upshot of that was that the McGregors all gathered their forces and charged at the Calhouns. Um, and the Calhouns outnumbered them and they were experts on cavalry. 
but the McGregors took great comfort from uh, their a soothsayer, a seer who was with them, who said he could see over the Calhouns, he could see the shrouds of the dead of their army, and the McGregor said, that'll do, bagpipes on, go! And they charged, and they um, annihilated the Calhouns. They left 150 Calhouns dead, which was uh, a huge number at that time. It went down in Scottish history as a massacre. Um, and um, very few of the McGregors died, but one of them uh, who did die was John McGregor, a, a brother of the chief, who was apparently killed uh, by an arrow aimed by a young man named McClintock, um, which uh, somehow managed to get through the neck joint of his chainmail and, and killed him. But anyway, the McGregors may have been thrilled and delighted, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, they were the rowdy McGregors, and what they'd just done was killed 150 of the slightly posh uh, Calhoun family. And the Calhouns were friends of King James. He was not impressed. Uh, the king actually came up to the area and met with the new Calhoun chieftain, and met 90 widows. It was extraordinary to imagine that, but he actually had to, apparently, had to meet 90 widows. Um, and the upshot of that was that the McGregors were outlawed, uh, hunted and flushed out, and they were made to give up their name, relinquish their name. Um, and 35 of them were rounded up and uh, executed uh, shortly afterwards. I tell you all this because I, I mean, the McClintocks were clearly involved, I think, on both sides. But as I say, I was talking earlier about how they're from Loch Lomond and Argyll. But you, can, you, know, you can see just how incredibly close uh, Scotland really is. Um, to where we are now heading, because this is where the McClintocks now make their way. They start off in Donegal, and you know the trade between Antrim and, and, and Scotland has been made a lot of money for a lot of people for many long centuries. Uh, and again, from Donegal, there were families like the Crawfords and the Cunninghams who were able to, uh, uh, who had, had a very uh, lucrative shipping business that ran from those two places. Um, during the 17th century, the key player, one of the key players, was um, Ludovic, Ludovic Stuart, um, who uh, was, as we mentioned earlier, more of the Lennox family. Um, and he was going to be a very influential guy. He was a, a great friend of King James I. And in the early 17th century, he basically took on the Port Lock patent, which is what brought the McClintocks and many others of those first Scottish settlers to Ireland. Um, this is Donegal as it was then. Um, and what we're looking at is the, um, the Barony of Raffo here, um, which was divided into two sections, um, the Port Lock and um, uh, uh, Lifford. And uh, the Port Lock one, was parceled out to loyal friends and uh, family uh, of the Duke of Stuart, uh, of the Duke of Lennox, which included the McClintocks. So we have arrived, uh, arrived in Ireland at this point. This is uh, sort of 1610, 1620, that sort of era. The first record of uh, a McClintock in Ireland is a guy called Alexander McClintock, who turns up on the muster roll of Ulster in 1630, uh, bearing a sword and a pike, uh, and in service to the Duke of Lennox, living in the barony of Raffo. Um, he married uh, a lovely, lovely lady called Agnes, Aggie, Agnes uh, McLean. Um, who had a, another rough ride. She'd lost uh, her father and seven brothers in uh, the Battle of Inverkeithing in Scotland, when basically uh, a force loyal to Charles II, or he would become Charles II, uh, they tried to hold up uh, Oliver Cromwell's new model army were coming in, and there was a, another big battle and another bad day for Scotland, uh, with, as I say, Agnes MacLean losing her father and seven brothers. They settled in Donegal in, in a place uh, called Trintoch, uh, Trintoch House um, in Raffo, um, and they are buried in Tochboyn Church. I hope I'm pronouncing uh, these places correctly. And that was Alexander, the first guy we mentioned there earlier. And I descend directly from him, and so do any of the other McClintocks in this room, and the branches of McClintocks at Drumcar, Lisnava, Seskinor, Red Hall, and so on, all descend from him. 
his son John, uh, who married uh, Janet Lowry, who was uh, the daughter of another prosperous Scottish guy who had come over and settled in County Tyrone. Um, and if any of you know the, the Belmore family, the Corrie Lowry family, that's the same, same clan. We move to the siege of Derry, because they were in and around Derry at the time of the siege. Uh, although uh, John McClintock, uh, who clearly had my, uh, my I, I'd be a terrible coward if it came to war, I have to say. And uh, he left Ireland as soon as, as soon as it broke out and lay low in Scotland for a while. So he was no, nowhere to be seen during the siege of Londonderry. But uh, his first child was born uh, around about that time. They return to Ireland, have 13 children. You know how these families are. Um, and one of those children is um, the guy who comes to Trump Car first, the first guy. Oh, sorry, we've gone through. Yeah, I just, you know, that whole period, I still don't, I'm still not sure whether the McClintocks were for uh, James II and the Battle of the Boyne and all that era, or for uh, William of Orange. It's very hard to know. What I do know is that uh, a lot of people would have, uh, who were against James II, maybe they just weren't ready for his dress sense yet, if you can see that. <laughs> He's clearly a man ahead of his time. Okay, so. This is Alexander McClintock of Trum Car, the man who, well, we call him Alexander McClintock of Trum Car because he was the first guy to uh, buy uh, the property at Trum Car. He was, uh, as I say, put to see there, born in 1692. And um, he went off to Dublin as a young fella and read law at Trinity, became a barrister, and uh, did extremely well during the Georgian age when barristers used to make a lot of money. They don't still make money, do they, barristers? No. Um, <laughs> um, actually, the, the, the Irish bar was in, in decline during that time if there are any barristers here. And uh, they, to the extent that they ceased to dine at the King's Inn, would you believe it? Anyway. He became extremely wealthy uh, during that period, um, and he married, he also married uh, a lady called Rebecca Sampson, who was from a very prosperous Dublin family. Um, but uh, they had no children, which was good news for his nephews and nieces, but certainly for his nephews. Um, and he became known in our family as the fairy godfather uh, to the aforementioned nephews and nieces. Not all of them. Uh, his nearest uh, natural heir was a guy called James McClintock, but there was some form of a bust up, so he got out of the will. Um, and then there was another fellow who was disinherited for marrying his first cousin, but you know, you're going to get all this stuff. Um, it was, as I say, Alexander who first published, uh, purchased the drum car estate um, here in Laos. Uh, in 1767, it had been with uh, various families, and I'd love to know more if any of you know more of the Talon, Cashel, Holt, uh, or Curtis families. He bought it in 1767. Uh, three years earlier, there was a, a sort of census of sorts taken. There were 12 Protestants and 363 Roman Catholics in the Drum Car Parish. But at that time, no church, no chapel. Uh, so he, um, he actually died at his townhouse on Dominic Street in Dublin in uh, 1775, uh, but is buried in Dunlear. Okay. Sir. Oh yes, he did it. Yeah, he had another nephew who, who's, who's quite uh, a character, another James McClintock, very extravagant individual who stabled 29 hunters and coach horses and always drove with four horses in his coach. That's not quite sight. Uh, but uh, such antics reduced the family fortune uh, to the extent that Trintoch, that was the family home up in Donegal, had to be sold shortly after his death. But that guy, um, James, his daughter Susanna married the Reverend Samuel Montgomery, uh, and their grandson, Henry Montgomery, who was a clergyman who became Bishop of Tasmania, was the father of Monty, of Montgomery Vale Alamein, uh, and uh, the McClintocks also proudly boast <laughs> that uh, Field Marshal Alexander of Tunis was also of the McClintock family. So there you go. We won the war and everything. Um, now we move on to Bumper Jack McClintock, who is Alexander's nephew um, and heir, his main heir, um, who uh, is also a direct ancestor of uh, myself and, and others here. 
Um, and it was he who commissioned the building of the vast mansion at the top of the ridge that many of you would know, John Power House, uh, in 1777. All the sevens. Uh, and that is where the McClintocks remained based until the 1940s. Uh, it started out as a straightforward Georgian block. I might have a picture of it before. So it started out as, yeah, the straightforward block in the middle, um, which would have been very nice, and then um, they, um, which was what, three stories over basement, two rooms deep, and a large central hall. And then they got a bit of a cash injection in the early 19th century, and they added the uh, Doric porch here, and uh, the two bays uh, at either edge and, sorry, the two wings, and the moulded windows surround as well. A guy called uh, Captain George Alexander was driving through the neighbourhood writing a traveller's guide. He was a travel writer in 1794. And he wrote, Two miles from Dunlear to the right and southeast side of the, of the Dee River, on an elevation beautifully wooded and commanding a variety of, of prospects over the meadows of that river, of which there are many and picturesque, is Drumcar, a new house, and the seat of John McClintock, a squire. So, uh, he married this lady, Patience McClintock. Sorry, the picture is uh, must be a little blurry. Um, but uh, she was one of the Fosters, which is a good family to marry into if you're going to be in uh, Ireland, in County Louth in the 18th century. Um, Jack McClintock was MP for Enniskillen. In, this is the time of Grattan's Parliament and all that when Ireland. Uh, was able to, it had basically a, a very good form of home rule going on at that time. They could pass laws without getting Westminster, Westminster's approval. And it was, a, it was a very exciting golden age for Ireland. And as I say, Jack was MP for Enniskillen. Um, and his patience, she was the daughter of William Foster uh, of, of these parts and a first cousin of uh, the Right Honourable John Foster, Speaker of the Irish House of Commons, the last Speaker of the Irish House of Commons. Um, so very influential people and very uh, good relatives to have at that stage. Um, so he, yeah, he was MP for Enniskillen and then he later became MP for Bell Turbot, if anybody knows Bell Turbot. I like Bell Turbot, but when John Wesley passed through the town in 1760, he described it as a town in which there is neither Papist nor Presbyterian, but to supply that defect, there are Sabbath breakers, drunkards, and common swearers in abundance. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, so there we go. We have uh, that's Speaker Foster there uh, on the stage, right? And this is this is quite a, a, a brilliant um, po a portrait of that uh, last Parliament of Ireland elected in 1790. And you're not really going to be able to see it properly, but uh, that's Speaker Foster at the centre of it all. Uh, that's John Philpot Curran. In fact, I can go one closer on that. That's uh, Curran, uh, John Philpot Curran there. And I recently found one of those sort of things that explains exactly who everybody is. And I tracked down John McClintock, Bumper Jack, with a degree of excitement. But I went down the line and then found him, and it's not very clear here, but he's actually fast asleep. Which is slightly embarrassing. The excitement of Bratton's Parliament and all that. Um, he was, um, if some of you know the Northern Rangers, uh, which was a hunt club founded in Dundalk in 1774 at Simon Bailey's Mill Inn. Um, he was uh, its uh, treasurer. He was one of the original 25 members and became its treasurer in 1783. Uh, the McClintocks were quite big in, into the Northern Rangers, um, and which by the 1790s had started um, uh, horse racing on the Claremont course um, and so on. So that's all part of that. Aha! John Suto, which is, this is not John Suto, but it might have been. Um, we mentioned uh, Brian uh, mentioned John earlier, and uh, yeah, I, I, I spoke to Brian a couple of years ago, and he asked me if I'd ever heard of a, a black servant called John Suto employed by the McClintocks at Drum Car in the late 18th century. And I said I did not, and I was most astonished to hear such a, a, a thing. What well, it basically it transpires. We've done quite a, as much, well, not as much research. There's more to more to do, but basically. 
um, a two-masted cargo ship um, called the Mary Ann was making its way from New York to Liverpool uh, when she ran aground near Dunaney Point. Um, and her, this is at the time that was the home of Robert Sib Sibthorpe, if anybody knows the Sibthorpe family, if you're interested to know more. Uh, this is on the coast of Lyle, very close to here. And it ran aground with a cargo of rum, tobacco, and staves. For a long time we thought it said rum, tobacco, and slaves in the newspaper account, but it says staves, which is timber. Uh, anyway, Sibthorpe quickly rallied to save the cargo and had to deal with a lot of plunderers and mutineers and everything. It sounds like a, a scene from Poldark, if any of you watched that show. Anyway, the idea is that um, this guy, John Suto, uh, was a, maybe a crew member on board the Marianne and that he subsequently stayed in Ireland. Um, and what we find is, uh, that was in that was 1783, I think. Anyway, two years later, the Freeman's Journal, 1785. The following extraordinary match took place last week at Drumcar near Dunleer. About two years ago, a ship was wrecked near that place, on board of which there was a black, who very soon afterwards became a servant at Drumcar. He often expressed the desire of marrying a white woman. This coming to the ear of Miss Margaret O'Brien of Clintonstown, County Louth, in that neighbourhood, this encouraged him to propose for her, and he got some friends to interfere. They had several meetings, and at last settled everything, and they were married before a vast crowd of people. There you go, 1785, it happened here. Uh, they auctioned the ship's contents afterwards, which uh, yeah, included tobacco, lots of various things, snuff, hickory, and so forth, but quite interestingly was four bales of sassaparella, which I have looked up to find out what sassaparilla was, and it was regarded as a medicinal cure for syphilis. There you go. Right, we move on to the next uh, family member, John uh, McClintock, known in our family as Old Turnip. I am still not sure why he was called Old Turnip. He, maybe he grew turnips. Um, he maybe he didn't look like a turnip. Uh, he maybe. <laughs> Maybe he said the word alternable. I don't know um, why he's called alternable. But he was born in Dublin in 1770, and he was the eldest son of Bumper Jack and Patience Foster. Um, and so his dad was, fi uh, he was five years old when his dad inherited a drum car and started building the uh, present house. He went to school in Drogheda, uh, and then in 1787, while the French revolutionaries are starting to sharpen their bayonets, uh, he went off to the University of Dublin, which is otherwise known as Trinity College, uh, and uh, he had planned to become a lawyer, and he went to Trinity, read law, but then changed his mind in 1794 when a vacancy became available at Parliament House, that uh, which we saw earlier, um, through uh, his mother's cousin, Speaker John Foster. See, it's all exactly the same, really, these days. Nepotism, alive and well. Um, so John uh, and his brother, William Foster McClintock, both secured quite lucrative posts uh, at the same time. And they were basically the sergeant at arms at, uh, at Parliament House on College Green for the next six years. They, I, uh, his salary for attending the first Parliament was £670 which I keyed into um, a sort of currency converter. I don't know if it's accurate or not. It seems to be that uh, it computed about 40,000 uh, euros in the present day. So, you know, nice money for Sergeant Speed. Um, he was, uh, just in a contemporary account, the con sorry. He was the contemporary of the most distinguished men at the time when the brilliancy of Irish genius was the theme of admiration throughout Europe. And it was. This is the time of Edmund Burke and, and you know, well, a little after Goldsmith and stuff, but um, Grattan, all these people who were very well known all around Europe at that time. He was a patriot in the true sense of the term, being consistently opposed to the Union when peerages, honours and decorations were lavished on those who supported such measures. So. There's uh, another John Carr house. Okay, so in 1797, um, he took a wife. Uh, and this is where we get our McClintock Bunbury name from. 
Um, but Jane Bunbury was the only daughter of William Bunbury, who was the MP for Carlo, um, and uh, he lived at Lisnavau, which is where my family live in County Carlo today. And her dad was <coughs> actually uh, thrown from a horse and killed when he was out riding uh, before she was born, a few months before she was born, so she never met her dad. Um, but uh, when Bumper Jack, to bring you back a generation, her father-in-law, when she was first introduced to her father-in-law, he made uh, the mistake of greeting her maid servant first, thinking that it was her, which was apparently a great blunder in, in those days. Daniel Defoe did something very similar, where he uh, kissed uh, a chambermaid hello instead of the lady he was being introduced to. Um, I loved it because he wrote afterwards, Daniel Defoe, he said, I remember I was very put, I'm oh, sorry, I, was, I remember I was put very much to the blush. <laughs> Lovely expression. Uh, anyway, I don't know where they got married, uh, possibly in Rathfilly, uh, or maybe in Dunleer, I don't know. Um, and nor do I particularly know where they lived. They spent a lot of time in Bath uh, at that time. But John McClintock, old turnip, was uh, the High Sheriff of County Louth in 1798, which was a slightly active year in, in Ireland. Uh, he was present, he fought at the battles of Arklow and Vinegar Hill. Um, his first son, John, who's the future uh, Lord Rathdonnell, was actually born that summer in, in, in August 1798. Um, and then Old Bumper Jack died in February 1799. So that's when Old Turnip <laughs> succeeded to drum the car. Um, then we had a... Yeah. Okay, that's a, a brother, one of his brothers, I think, am I right? Sorry, I've got to start out of there. This is one of his uh, brothers who uh, was um, the rector of Castle Bellingham. I think, sorry, let me get through. I see what's happened. Okay, sorry. 1798, we rise through to the Act of Union. Okay. So, um, Speaker Foster and uh, John McClintock were both vehemently opposed to the Act of Union. Um, and there was quite a, a thing when Sir Jonah Barrington, who was a great chronicler of that time period, um, he described how they were the last two people to leave when this building was closed down to become a bank eventually. Um, they were the last two people to leave, and um, Sir Jonah Barrington wrote. Both men seemed impressed with the solemnity of the occasion, when at the door they turned around and took a last view of that house which had been, as Grattan observed, the glory, the guardian, and the protection of the country. So, uh, there you go. The, um, Foster had uh, this mace, was very important, and the law was that no, nothing, no business could be conducted unless this mace was in the house, no motion could be made, none of that stuff which is why uh, Speaker Foster absolutely refused to surrender the mace and apparently uh, he kept it under his bed up in County Louth about 40 years afterwards. Maybe somebody knows a bit more about that. Anyway, it's in Parliament House now. Um, poor old Jane Bunbury. I mentioned that her father died in a horse fall uh, before she was born. She, she too uh, was fated to die in a horse fall um, in Bath, the wife of John McClintock of Drumcar, at the age of 23, in the full bloom of youth and beauty from the society of her husband, children, parents, family, and friends, she was snatched, uh, which is very sad, and she left three small children, um, one of whom was the future First Lord Rathdonnell, another was uh, William McClintock, who adopted the name William McClintock Bunbury as my uh, ancestor. So, um, there's, a, if you know Drum Car, there are memorials to quite a lot of these people scattered around the walls, and I'm not going to read that out to you. You may be deeply relieved to know. That is, so her son, John McClintock, this portrait is actually in our house in County Carlo. I was terrified of it when I was young. I was terrified of most of the portraits in my house, and one of the reasons I became a historian was to try and work out who all these scary people were, so they'd be a little less scary. Um, but um, we then found another picture of him a little later in life, and he looked a little less scary. Um, and then we found uh, a photograph of him, and he looked perfectly normal and cheerful. So I've, I've become friends with him at this stage. Um, yes, okay, so he, um, he actually inherited a drum, drum car in 
1855, and he was here until his own death in 1879. Um, he was uh, MP for County Lyres during his younger years, and then through, he was a, a Tory, and he uh, was on the good side of Benjamin Disraeli, um, and through, it was through Disraeli that he was created Baron Rathdonnell in 1868. Um, and he chose the title Rathdonnell after a, a bit some of the McClintock property back up in Donegal, very near Trintock House, uh, a couple of hundred years earlier. Um, so, his wife, um, who didn't scare me uh, when I was a child, um, but what she does do is just gets younger and younger every time I look at her. She used to be you know, an old woman when I was tiny, and now she's <laughs> tiny, I think. Uh, but she was Anne Lefroy, um, and uh, she, uh, I don't know if there's Lefroy family members here, but she, her first cousin was a guy called Tom Lefroy, uh, who would later become the Chief Justice of Ireland. Um, and uh, he uh, would come to stay with them a lot in Bath, where she grew up. And uh, it was during that time that they uh, met, apparently, Jane Austen. And if you know the, uh, the story Becoming Jane, in which uh, Jane Austen uh, has a, a romance with uh, Tom Lefroy. So, um, it's sort of moving into that world. Uh, and this is, uh, as I mentioned, my own ancestor, William McClintock Bunbury, who um, I call him a man of good neck because I feel that he has an extraordinarily long neck. I've always felt that. But you need, he was a nautical man, he was a sailor. It's good to have a long neck if you're a sailor, you get to bend it around, look at things. Um, then, okay, so he. In the 1840s, he um, got inherited uh, a huge amount of money from a banking uncle uh, uh, with the instruction that he spend that huge amount of money at once building this ridiculously big house, which is called Listen of Our. Uh, and they did, they spent nearly all their money on building this ridiculously big house, which is Listen of Our in County Carlo. It's not as big as this anymore. But this is relevant because what is going to happen before long is that the McClintocks are going to have both Lisnavar and Drum Carr vested in one person, uh, and a decision is reached to live it in one and not the other. Um, but uh, this is old pictures of old Lisnavar, but the, a lot of the portraits that I've shown you earlier are on the walls of old and new Lisnavar McClintocks, all down there. Now we have to run into through Henry McClintock. I'm conscious of the time factor here as well. I don't want to keep you overly. Um, Henry McClintock, um, and as I say, hats off to Podrick O'Neill, who, if any of you have seen the amazing journal of Henry McClintock, which is a, a serious doorstopper of a book which he translated, uh, or transcribed rather, but um, Henry McClintock, who um, really inspired the Jedward haircut, more than anybody else. Uh, um, he was um, a, a pretty an interesting guy, really. I mean, his, his, di his diary wouldn't be described as unputdownable reading, um, but it's definitely a, 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 an amazing resource for anybody studying the history of this part of the world during the early 19th century. Um, he was in the Third Dra Dragoon Guards when he was a young fellow, uh, but then he married the daughter of the uh, Archdeacon of Waterford and uh, retired, and he became the collector of customs at Dublin Port, uh, which is where he and his wife, um, sorry, Dun 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 Dundalk Port, sorry. Uh, where he and his wife settled at uh, number one Seatown Place. Um, and he died in 1843 and he was buried in, in Dundalk. Uh, one of the family members recalled him as an excellent good man and a good rider and a sportsman. And although very poor and with a large family to support, he was very popular with all his neighbors and friends. And his diary, he talks about all sorts of uh, things. I mean, I love, he talks about uh, claret in the days when your doctor his doctor ordered him to leave off all medicines for a day or two and to take three wine glasses of claret with his dinner. <laughs> Love that. I want a doctor like that. Uh, then the I, I don't know. I, I missed this film, but uh, that whole uh, grim story of the Wild Goose Lodge when eight people were deliberately burned to death um, it, at uh, Lisreni, I think it was somewhere near there. I think. Um, and then subsequently, at least eighteen men were rounded up and executed. And uh, and uh, he, because I guess because he's a local gentleman and a magistrate and a member of the yeomanry, uh, he turns up and he attends quite a lot of the executions, um, uh, where he says, yes, this man, who is it, uh, Patrick Devon, 
um, fully confessed his guilt on the gallows. After he was hanged, his body was put into iron chains and conveyed to Corpria uh, and hung there on a gibbet. Um, and then a couple of days later, Bessie and I rode to Hackball's Cross and saw three gibbets there of men executed for the burning of the Wild Goose Lodge. Lovely day out they had in the old days, didn't they? <laughs> anyway, there you go. Um, this is quite something that I hope you'll um, that will turn up for you next year, or maybe uh, 1819, is it? Yeah. On October the 23rd, 1819, so you've got a couple of years before this one, Henry uh, wrote in his diary, fine day, George Foster rode on a velocipede from the barrack yard to the market house in Dundalk in three seconds under eight minutes, winning his wager by three seconds only. He started at about half past ten in the morning. Um, it is quite something. Basically, George Foster's velocipede, we are concluding, was one, probably one of 320 velocipedes, early bicycles, made in London in 1819. There was a drop frame version for ladies to ride as well, uh, where you could sort of hang your long skirts. Um, and yeah, they've been invented in 1818 by a French, uh, by a German. Um, and they were also known as a dandy horse. And they were all the rage. It was, you know, like we have crazes now. Anyway, this was the craze in, in just in the summer and autumn of 1819, and it died out when surgeons warned that it damaged your health, uh, and local authorities prohibited the pastime as it was causing just too many accidents, uh, either by collisions with pedestrians or by simple falls. And I, I note, I, I direct your attention to this man here, he's really simply falling. Um, so they said, ah, that was short-lived, and they gave up the idea that the bicycle was not invented until the 1860s. They came close, they came close. Okay, we are, okay, I'll spin you through the story of the uh, Franklin, because we have to do Franklin, because uh, the McClintock connection to the Franklin Memorial, uh, which I, I was over in Greenwich um, a few, uh, the weekend before last, and, and saw the memorial there, but, um, so Sir John Franklin, for those who don't know, was uh, sort of an extremely well-known household name in his day. He'd been an explorer in his younger years. He then became a, a governor of uh, Van Diemen's Land in Australia uh, and, and various other things. Um, and when he was reasonably old, I can't remember, he was in his late 50s, I think, uh, he was uh, assigned, given command of another expedition up to the Arctic Circle um, to try and find the, the Northwest Passage through to the other side, a, a challenge that had been bugging people for centuries. So um, he set off with, I can't remember how many men, 130 men, I think, and they were uh, never seen again. Um, and the first year uh, was fine, because everybody assumed that if you go off into the polar ice caps, it's going to take a while before we hear anything. And then in the second year, they were thinking, right, anybody heard from him? No, nobody had heard from him. So uh, the powers that be, sorry, that was, sorry, that's the Arctic Circle. He was heading up to try and find his way, two ships, two, two of the Royal Navy's most um, expensive cutting edge ships called the Erebus and the Terror. And they set off to try and find a way through this maze that would bring them around to the uh, lucrative Chinese markets and so on. Um, and they were last seen in Franklin's ship coming in here, and they disappeared. So they, um, as I say, they started, people started talking, councils got together and said, right, what are we going to do? And they sent mission after mission after mission to try and find out what had happened for, to Franklin. It was a, a cause celeb at the time. Um, and one guy came back fairly early on, a Scottish guy, and, and delivered a report to say that they'd eaten each other, um, which they were eating what? Uh, and so they had to hush that on up very quickly and not accept it. Uh, and unfortunately, they hadn't all eaten each other, don't, don't worry, but there had been a little bit of that sort of carry on. Inevitably, that's going to happen in that world. Um, but it then fell to uh, Sir Francis Leopold McClintock, who uh, was the son of Henry McClintock, the Jedward Collector of Customs. Um, and he set off, and uh, he was, um, you know, even at that time, where was it? he had, yeah, he, he already had a, a good reputation as a, as a polar explorer. He'd been on three Arctic expeditions in the early 1850s, 
Uh, on one of them, he traveled 1,400 miles by sledge and discovered 800 miles of previously unknown coastline. Uh, and he basically, it was actually a Lady Jane Franklin, uh, Sir John Franklin's wife. Everybody else had given up, but she was still commissioning people to go. And he basically said, I'm game on, I'll give it a crack, I'll give it a shot. Uh, he got unpaid leave from the Royal Navy, um, uh, as did his second in command, Lieutenant William Hobson. And they set sail in a small uh, yacht, a steam yacht, called the Fox in 1857, uh, and immediately became trapped in the ice in uh, Baffin Bay uh, for six months. But anyway, they got through, and eventually they got down to a place called King William Island, uh, where they went off on, on sledges, oh, sorry, wrong one, uh, on sledges and so forth. And uh, got down to, to King William Island, and uh, Hobson found uh, a message which was uh, in their cairn, which basically explained that they, that Franklin's guys had all got bogged in ice, moored in ice. He found this message, uh, and what had happened to them was written around this side. Initially, the first report is here, Sir John, Sir John Franklin commanding the expedition, all well. And then we have this horrific footnote from 1847, which explains how actually they weren't at all well. A lot of them were already dead, the rest were dying they decided they were going to try and make their way across the ice. Um, none of them got back alive, but uh, McClintock, having found this vital clue, returned and had a channel named after him. He was knighted, he was given the freedom of the city of London, he wrote a best-selling book, uh, and he became a rear admiral and was put in charge of Portsmouth's dockyard. Uh, I will skip his very short-lived political career, which didn't uh, really go very well. But uh, I think you could probably devote an entire talk to him. Um, okay. I'm going to spin through uh, this. We can come back to it if anybody asks the right question. Yeah. Um, what we. You, you can't see the pictures at all? Oh, but that's probably a good thing. <laughs> okay. Well, look, I, I, I'll. Okay, very quickly. Um, after Jane Bunbury, uh, McClintock fell off the horse and died, her husband uh, cleverly married again. He married this lady, Lady Elizabeth McClintock, who was a daughter of the first Earl of Clan Carty. Um, and she was, uh, she founded a Protestant element, the Protestant Elementary School in Drum Carr um, in 1825. And she was a Protestant proselytizer. They were both very uh, evangelical. There was a big evangelical drive at this time. I've been reading about it. Um, the Protestant, I, th I guess, it's slightly because uh, of fears of Catholic emancipation, uh, and it was also because the very notion of Christianity was starting to come under threat in the 1820s and 1830s. People were starting to discover things like dinosaurs that they, you know, people couldn't get their heads around. Explorers were coming back with, you know, news of the wider world, and uh, this would have triggered a sort of evangelical mood. Uh, and uh, Lady Elizabeth and her husband, Old Turner, um, were certainly e evangelical in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, but, you know, I should add that in 1852, there was a petition from 114 people describing themselves as the Roman Catholic farmers, tradesmen, and laborers of John McClintock's estate of John Carr, who denounced uh, accusations that he was a bigot, uh, and they pointed out that he had contributed to the construction of Dillonstown Church, uh, that he never favored Protestant tenants over Catholics, that he employed a large number of both, uh, and that when tenants fell into arrears, he didn't have them evicted. So um, it's hard to know what, how these things are. Um, they uh, had a lot of children, and a lot of them died. Four, four of them died in one year, but no. Um, this guy, Reverend Robert McClintock, um, was the rector of Castle Bellingham, and we're nearly there, by the way. Um, okay. He um, became, well, he was installed as rector of Kilsaren. Am I saying that right, Kilsaren? Uh, Age 25 in 1835, uh, and he went on to be rector of Castle Bellingham. Uh, he married the daughter of an Indian judge, and we have quite a lot of letters uh, from him to uh, Captain Clinton Bunbury at Vistava. Um, one of them talks about his threshing machine that he just got in 1847, so quite interesting. 
Um, but he was once approached while walking around Castle Bellingham by an old man who told him that one of the graves, you might know this, somebody else might know this story, but that uh, one of the graves was that of Napper Tandy, James Napper Tandy, the United Irishman of 1798. Apparently, his remains were brought over from France to Dunedin or Anagassan uh, and buried at the dead of night in, uh, in the graveyard. So, I don't know. There's uh, memorials to him galore in the uh, mausoleum at Trumcar. And uh, I think he's got a memorial window in the parish church and also here in the parish church in Castle Bellingham. That is the mausoleum. Am I standing the way? Um, yeah. That is the mausoleum which uh, has seen better, better days. Um, we did do some work on it to try and restore it a few years ago. Uh, and pulled away some of the ivy. I mean, it really was, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous work, I must say. It, it'd be great to get it going. Um, okay, uh, this is where I was trying to get to. So, um, roughly what happened was um, the Lord Raston of the time had two sons, uh, Billy and uh, Tim, and it was his intention for Billy to inherit a Savar and for Tim to inherit a drum car. Uh, or something, or, or perhaps vice versa. But in the Boer War, Billy went off to fight in the Boer War and he was killed in action uh, at the age of 20. So suddenly he was down to one son with two properties. Uh, there's a memorial to, uh, to Billy in the church in Drum Car. Um, and he decided to settle on Lisnava. Um, and he sold Drum Car, and we're coming full circle, I think, to where Brian was, to his. This is the Lord Rathdonnell of the time. He, um, sorry, if I'm around this side, this thing goes. Bzz. Okay. He sold uh, Drum Car to uh, Francis Lepore McClintock, who was the rector of Drum Car, um, otherwise known as Frank. Uh, that was in 1903. And Frank, uh, who was a very musical man, he had been private chaplain to the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Um, and he was, as I say, rector of Drumcar, Dean of Armagh. Uh, he lived in the rectory at Drumcar, but um, he uh, installed his twin sisters in Drumcar House. I wonder if any of you uh, encountered them. Uh, sorry, that's his girl, Emily and Gertrude, the twin sisters. They never married, um, and it was they remained there until they were the last of the McClintocks to reside at Drum Car. My grandfather uh, spent a certain amount of his childhood there. He was uh, a frequent visitor, I think, simply because the two sisters were apparently quite good as children, um, and he uh, lost his mother as a young child. Uh, look, you've been extremely patient. That's a, a lot of information to try and digest and take in, um, and I, I apologise for the hit and miss every now and then, but thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.